This is Duke University. Well, good, good afternoon. My name is Neil Siegel, and I co-direct the program in public law here at Duke Law School. Uh, we are very pleased today to have uh, Professor Ronell Anderson-Jones. Uh, she's an associate professor of law at Brigham Young University's J. Reuben Clark Law School, where she teaches a number of courses, constitutional law, the First Amendment, legislation, and media law. Uh, after Professor Jones graduated first in her law school class, uh, she clerked for the Honorable William Fletcher on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, as well as Associate Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court of the United States. And I first got to know Professor Jones during the court's October 2003 term, where uh, I was there at the court with her, as was Professor Margaret Lemos as well. It was, uh, it was a great year, and uh, uh, Professor Jones was a very important clerk that year, and I am, uh, I, I am to this day grateful grateful for her. Uh, before entering the legal, uh, the legal Academy, Professor Jones was an attorney in the appellate division of Jones Day, where her work focused on Supreme Court litigation and included major constitutional and First Amendment cases. But she's not just a lawyer and a law professor, or at least she hasn't always been. She's also a former newspaper reporter and editor, and she researches and writes on legal issues affecting the press and on the intersection between media and courts. She's a regular presenter at media law conferences, was the director of a nationwide empirical study of the frequency and impact of subpoenas served upon newspapers and television newsrooms. Her work on this project is regularly cited uh, in debates on Capitol Hill. Uh, it's been featured in various papers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, even made it onto MSNBC, Fox News, and National Public Radio. And if you can target all those audiences with the same study, you've really accomplished something. Uh, from uh, 2004 to 2008, Professor Jones was a distinguished faculty fellow at the University of Arizona, Rogers College of Law. And uh, she, their team taught uh, an annual course on the Supreme Court with Justice O'Connor, which is some indication of what this justice thinks about her former law clerk. Uh, she'll be speaking with us today about rethinking the reporter's privilege. Maybe we've been thinking about the problem the wrong way all along. Maybe it's not the reporter, but the anonymous source who should be the relevant constitutional rights holder. Uh, she's going to speak for as, as, as long as she likes, and I anticipate that we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. Uh, I welcome you to Duke Law School. Thanks so much um, for having me, and especially uh, to Professor Siegel for um, his kind introduction and his kind uh, invitation to come. Um, he and Professor Lemos were two of my favorite people in the building the year that I clerked at the court, and I, it seems to me almost an embarrassment of riches um, for Duke to have both of them at one time. So I hope that you do know how lucky you are um, to have you know, both their exceptionally top-notch minds, but also their completely delightful personalities um, for you here during your law school experience. Um, as Professor Siegel said, uh, before uh, turning course uh, to the law, uh, I was a newspaper reporter and editor, or in the language of the US Supreme Court's major uh, media law cases, all of which came about in the 1970s. I was a newsman. Um, <laughs> And uh, as a former newsman, um, I'm interested in the way that law impacts journalism. And one big way that uh, law um, and journalism interact is in the realm of confidential sources. Journalists use them. Um, they claim that their value to news gathering is critical. And they claim that that value is ensured only when um, their promises of confidentiality uh, can be maintained. Uh, we've seen in recent years a flurry of cases involving reporters who feel so strongly um, about keeping these promises that they refuse to respond um, to subpoenas demanding the names of these sources. Um, uh, you've probably, um, I know you don't all follow them as closely as I do, but there are um, numerous, the, the, the watershed case, the big case that everybody knows about is Judy Miller. Judith Miller spent 80 plus days in jail after refusing to name a source in a story involving CIA agent Valerie Plame. Turned out that the source was um, Vice Presidential 
Chief of Staff Scooter Libby, um, and only when he himself came forward to identify himself was she released. Uh, Mark Fainarawada and Lance Williams, our reporters um, from San Francisco Chronicle, held in contempt for refusing to reveal the name of a source in a San Francisco Chronicle story involving um, the large uh, widespread um, steroid scandal there. Tony Losey um, is a USA Today reporter who was caught up in a um, series of uh, reporter subpoenas involving a leak of some details on a person of interest in the anthrax case. Uh, the judge in her case took the un then unprecedented step of barring her newspaper employer, USA Today, from uh, paying any portion of the compounding um, um, fines for when she was held in contempt, which left her individually with hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines that she faced um, in each day that she refused um, to reveal the name. More recently, uh, this is James Risen. He's a New York Times reporter, and his case is currently pending this month uh, before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, a subpoena arising out of a project exposing the alleged bungling of an operation related to some Iranian um, nuclear weapons. Uh, the district court found that Risen was justified in refusing to expose his source, but there are some very good reasons to believe that the Fourth Circuit will not be so keen uh, on it. Uh, and so we see that these cases are coming up um, quite regularly, and that there are serious debates over these cases. Right? We might think that in some, maybe many, maybe most um, cases, there are some strong arguments for exempting reporters from having to respond um, to these subpoenas. But we might also think that there are cases um, when other values are really at stake um, and may, in fact, um, trump the news gathering value. And the line drawing in these areas isn't easy. Um, there are lots of values um, that are competing against one another. I'm really fascinated um, with this area, uh, both because I think it's a truly interesting um, and unique communications law question with really deep quench um, tensions over the role of the press in our society, the role of anonymous information in our democracy, but also I'm interested in it because constitutionally it revolves around a truly unique um, Supreme Court opinion. That case, Brandsburg versus Hayes, was argued exactly 40 years ago this month um, by three reporters from large metropolitan newspapers with the amicus support of virtually every major news outlet in the country. The reporters asked the court to recognize a First Amendment right of journalists uh, not to reveal the sources to whom they had promised confidentiality on the theory that the flow of information to the public, um, which they said was protected by the speech and press clauses, would be impeded if these promises couldn't be kept. Now, a really slender Brandsburg majority um, rejected this theory. It found that there is no such First Amendment right um, to news gather. But a really vigorous dissent, written really actually in the tone of a majority opinion, set forth a super careful test for a qualified um, reporter's privilege. Um, this was a qualified privilege that the four dissenters thought should govern this situation. It would um, they acknowledged a First Amendment right to news gather that is journalist focused. Um, it belongs to those engaging in the reporter um, enterprise. And in what may be the single most nebulous um, opinion ever penned by any justice, although I think I have to concede that the competition for that prize would be um, truly fierce. Uh, Justice Lewis Powell contributed a concurring opinion in Brandsburg that provided the critical fifth vote um, against the reporters, but that emphasized the narrowness of the holding and really spoke in these ridiculously glowing terms about the role of reporters in our society um, and um, the role of news gathering and the importance of protecting it. And he insisted that, quote, the courts will be available to newsmen under circumstances where legitimate First Amendment interests require protection. Now, seizing upon this language, some clever media lawyers crafted an argument that legitimate First Amendment interests require protection in a whole bunch of circumstances. And uh, by about a decade post Brandsburg, the dissent's qualified privilege test actually had become the governing constitutional standard in nearly every circuit in the country, with them basically counting Powell's vote with the dissenters um, in, for almost every reporter's privilege case that's not on all fours with the somewhat specific grand jury-related facts of Brandsburg versus Hayes. 
So the starting point for any inquiry about constitutional norms and reporters' privilege then is this post-Brandsburg reality, that we have tackled this very interesting um, and important um, dynamic between reporters um, and confidential sources in an exclusively reporter-focused way. We set up this qualified privilege that belongs to and is asserted by the news gatherer. Now, I think there are at least two big questions that are worth asking um, about this Brandsburg approach. One of them is, I'm just really interested always in why we end up with the constitutional developments that we do, particularly when, as I um, assert here, there are multiple constitutional frameworks sort of readily available for utilization in a given communicative context. I think it's interesting to think about why and how the court comes to a place of thinking of this issue through this lens. And um, I did some exploring of this, and I think it's really interesting how we came to think about the reporter confidential source situation through an exclusively reporter-focused um, approach. Uh, it is, this case is clearly um, a product of its times. The tenor of the times was a major um, influence in the court's determination um, to think about it in the way that it did. There was a great historical momentum surrounding the Pentagon Papers and the Watergate era sort of investigative reporting. We were at the height, the sort of apex of thinking of um, reporters as important watchdogs in our society. And these cultural and social norms um, combined also with some really important litigation incentives um, on the part of big media companies Companies. Big media companies were, of course, almost single-handedly funding all of the watershed lawsuits involving subpoenas um, to reporters for confidential sources. And these things combined to produce this doctrinal development that has the courts asking only whether the rights of the news gatherer um, have been infringed by a request to reveal a source's name. Second, and maybe more substantively, um, I'm interested in um, thinking about what it would look like if we made a doctrinal shift to a source focus. Um, and I think it's worth exploring what that kind of change in lens uh, might look like. The analytical device for effectuating that shift um, is the anonymous speech doctrine. There is, it turns out, a deep and analytically thorough body of First Amendment doctrine from the Supreme Court that makes clear that in addition to having a constitutional freedom to speak, we have a fundamental right not to identify ourselves when we do so. Uh, and the cases that bring this about are mostly cases involving for, um, people charged with violating, for example, laws against anonymous leafleting, or laws mandating that if you want to go door to door and engage in advocacy, you have to wear an identification badge. And in these kinds of cases, the court has really spoken unequivocally um, about both the historical recognition uh, of the founders uh, of this value of anonymous communication in a society and of the perceived ongoing societal need um, to protect this right. Um, and the language from the court, uh, these cases, if you read them closely, are peppered with really powerful statements in support of this right. So the court says things like, sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, says things like, Persecuted groups throughout history have been able to criticize oppressive practices and laws either anonymously or not at all. That's how we get our words out there. Um, there are certain things that we will not say unless we can say it under the shield of anonymity. Identification and fear of reprisal might deter perfectly peaceful discussions, the court tells us. Anonymity has often been assumed for the most constructive of purposes. It is, in the language of one of the cases, a shield from the tyranny of the majority. It's not a pernicious fraudulence practice, but an honorable tradition of advocacy and dissent. And we see the court um, emphasizing time and again that anonymous or pseudonymous speech has played um, an important role in the progress of mankind. Um, they're citing the long tradition of influential authors that utilized one of these approaches. Um, we're talking about the authors of the Federalist Papers, Mark Twain, um, O. Henry, Voltaire, George Eliot. So we're told that this right is as fundamental a right as the right to speak itself. And thus, it can be infringed directly only if the encroachment by the government survives strict scrutiny. That is, the identification of the speaker is the least restrictive means of meeting a compelling governmental interest. Now, I argue that the most analytically and doctrinally consistent way to approach the reporter source context is through this same lens. The confidential source is, after all, um, a would-be anonymous speaker. And his chosen vehicle is a newspaper article rather than an anonymous leaflet, 
but whose motivations remain, to remain unidentified are likely parallel, um, and whose rights to speak anonymously are equally infringed um, if he is unmasked. Now, um, a source technically has, of course, revealed his identity once, right? To the reporter. Um, but it's only to the reporter who's the vehicle um, for his publication. And the court has already made clear that some incidental identification doesn't interfere with the assertion of the anonymous speech right um, if anonymity is the ultimate um, sought after goal. And I think likewise, we also have to concede that these aren't perfectly parallel situations, right? It has to be conceded that a reporter is a somewhat more active intermediary than other vehicles that somebody might use to make their to make public um, their anonymous speech, right? Perhaps the reporter takes a more active role in translating the message or determines which portions of the information to include, placing it you know, within a larger context in a news story. But that choice of communications mechanism is one that's legitimately made by the speaker, right? And almost all communication is mediated in some way. Leafleteers convey their message uh, by way of a printer. Um, individuals who communicate seemingly directly online are actually doing so through an internet service provider. And in choosing the mechanism by which your speech will be mediated, every single speaker conducts uh, what I think of as sort of a risk-benefit calculation. And in this um, situation that I'm discussing, the source presumably has accepted whatever additional consequences come with mediating his communication through a reporter for whatever perceived benefit benefits might be out there, right? It might be a wider audience, the gathering of greater support for the message, the increased legitimacy that might attend a message that's delivered through this vehicle. The important common element for First Amendment analysis is that the source who speaks on condition of confidentiality has made a conscious choice uh, in favor of anonymity. And the value of anonymous speech to the substance of our public debate and to the liberty interests of the speaker. That value has been recognized by the court without regard um, to the vehicle that's chosen to convey the message to the listeners. OK, so there are um, what I think of as three sets of doctrinal and practical benefits that might come along with a shift to this source-focused approach. First, and I think maybe most importantly, in addressing this situation through this lens is the only way to recognize the full set of First Amendment values that are at stake and to place the reporter source dynamic more properly within our First Amendment framework in sort of a consistent way. A careful reading of the anonymous speech cases shows the court in nearly every case of an unnamed speaker articulating two separate sets of values that are at stake when a person speaks anonymously. And we might label them, um, just for ease, the public information First Amendment values and the individual liberty First Amendment values. The public information values speak to the First Amendment's goal of encouraging community-serving information, increasing contributions that people are willing to make to the marketplace of ideas, and in so doing, sort of enriching discourse and enhancing our democratic self-governance. So if a speaker is denied anonymity, the thinking goes, she may self-censor worried about privacy concerns or about a variety of forms of retaliation. And this impedes the flow of information to the public. And thus, these public First Amendment goals call for strong protection for anonymity. Importantly, these public information First Amendment goals are the sole focus of that post-Brandsburg um, reporter-based approach. Portions of the reporter's privilege case, uh, cases, although never really referencing this anonymous speech jurisprudence, they're almost identical in terms of expressing um, concern about retaliation and source identification and privacy concerns that get in the way of and hinder this flow of information to the public. But those are not the only values at stake. Also at stake, as recognized in the anonymous speech case law, but not in the Brandsburg line, our individual liberty First Amendment values. The anonymous speech cases tell us that the First Amendment is, at its core, an individual speech freedom provision. The freedom to speak anonymously serves the individual autonomy and self-fulfillment goals of the First Amendment by enabling individuals to do things like explore new ideas or investigate new means of expression, even new identities, right? To guarantee that readers won't prejudge my message because they dislike or they like its proponent. Um, it gives me the chance to derive internal satisfaction from choosing whether or not to claim authorship of the particular piece that I've written. And the absence of this set of values 
in the current reporter's privilege calculation is no small lapse because it's the recognition of these values that situates the anonymous speech doctrine within its rightful place in our larger First Amendment structure. The core individual right that we have under the First Amendment is a freedom from content control by our government. And time and again in the anonymous speech uh, jurisprudence, the court has properly recognized that at least direct bans on anonymous speech are, in both a theoretical and a practical sense, their content control. Right? Identification requirements force the speaker to reveal the content of her thoughts um, on a particular issue. And as a sort of practical matter, they require her to add a line of content, namely by Ronell Anderson Jones, that she preferred, she had made the editorial judgment to exclude. And content control ordinarily gets strict scrutiny from the courts. And in the anonymous speech context, when faced with direct bans on anonymity, the courts have followed this pattern. OK, so one, the first of the benefits is that we would be thinking about a larger set of values that are at stake, um, that the sources' rights, um, these uh, individual liberty rights, are equally as at play as the public information rights. But second, switching from a reporter to a source focus, I think, avoids what are widely regarded as the major drawbacks of analyzing the situation in this post-Brandsburg lens. For starters, and so importantly, it eliminates the need to define who is a reporter for purposes of the privilege. And this is a task that you can imagine has become complicated to a degree of near impossibility, right, in this changing technological media age. Um, it is a topic on which um, gallons of spilt ink um, are out there. Uh, basically, every First Amendment and media law scholar um, in the country has received tenure on the question of who should be a reporter um, for purposes. And, and they never seem to quite reach a satisfactory conclusion. And importantly, I think, they run up against other constitutional concerns when they start to put the government itself in the position of defining the press, right? That's perilously close to the sort of untoward and constitutionally unacceptable practice of licensing the press. We don't really want the government drawing those kinds of lines. Unlike the Brandsburg approach, the anonymous speech doctrine doesn't rise and fall on the nature of the speaker the nature of the audience, the value of the information communicated. The threshold question is simply whether there is a speaker who wished to convey a message without attribution and whether governmental um, interference directly uh, hindered this constitutionally protected form of communication. Additionally, this shift would enable the court to avoid the complex and I think largely speculative um, investigations into just how great a contribution the press makes to public dialogue, um, and what degree of protection is necessary to continue that contribution. This is the so-called proving a negative problem that really plagued the Brandsburg majority, and it really continues to hover over the whole reporter's privilege doctrine to this day. Right? Here's the question. Do sources really dry up if there isn't a First Amendment scheme in place to guarantee confidentiality uh, and the promises of confidentiality can be kept? Will reporters really shy away from investigative reporting um, in the absence of um, these news gathering rights? The post-Brandsburg reporter's privilege absolutely rises and falls on the existence of these chilling effects. Conversely, um, under the anonymous speech doctrine, while the court has said that the elimination of these barriers of sort of um, flow of information to the public is an aspiration, right, to be served by protecting anonymous speech, it hasn't described it as the guiding justification for that protection. Content control is an encroachment on one's liberty. It's forbidden regardless of any showing that it actually produces a chill. It's something government may not do, absent a compelling interest met through a least restrictive means. Third, the adoption of an anonymous speech approach should lead to what I think of as a positive development in the actual assertion of the right. Importantly, I think it would move us from a place where the anonymous um, move us from a, a place where the anonymous speaker doesn't have any mechanism for asserting um, rights in a situation that really involves them to a place where the anonymous speaker may herself press her own right. Um, and besides the obvious benefit of, I guess, giving individuals the power to assert their own individual liberties um, when arguably infringed by government action, this development might really matter in the changing world of journalism. These large corporate newspaper companies, like those that litigated um, the issues in Brandsburg, are disappearing or are at least becoming less able or less willing um, to fund these large-scale um, litigations in the constitutional battles. 
Additionally, however, I would envision that reporters and media companies who remain financially able could act as enforcers of the constitutional right through an assertion of third party standing. Uh, the prudential limitation that courts um, ordinarily place on third party standing uh, is regularly overcome when the court feels reassured that there's a practical impediment of the actual holder of the right litigating it himself and the party um, asserting the third party standing shares some kind of relationship that's close or inextricably bound up in the activity that the uh, litigant wishes to pursue. And this is surely the case here, right? The relationship is at least as close as and arguably closer than uh, many relationships found by the court to suffice for third party standing. A number of cases have already found that shared First Amendment or communicative purposes are especially compelling shared relationships for these purposes, and the genuine obstacle requirement is um, almost um, ridiculously easy to show, right? The, um, the um, source's absence from court would not have a tendency to suggest that his right isn't truly at stake or isn't truly important to him. It's just explainable by the very reasons that anonymity is being sought. So because the confidential source issue will most often arise in this context of a subpoena to the reporter for the source's name. Allowing the reporter to act as a surrogate in the litigation of the anonymous speech right seems like it would be practically important in addition to being doctrinally appropriate. Now finally, um, I think it's interesting that we have um, a little line of cases out there that I believe demonstrates the workability of this paradigm shift. Um, these are cases that deal with the limited, but I think quite closely analogous setting of anonymous online posters. Now, um, maybe you've all thought about these people and probably you've thought about them in less than positive terms. Um, these cases involve the comments that you've probably all seen on the web pages of the newspapers that you read online. Um, so we have the story and then tacked on after the story, there are people who call themselves, you know, Jelly Beanster or um, whatever else, um, whatever name they've given themselves. Um, and sometimes these comments after the fact are really thoughtful. Um, sometimes they add insight, um, they um, move forward a public dialogue on a matter, and sometimes um, they do not do any of those things, right? Um, sometimes they're absurd or silly or hurtful or um, all the other things that people do when they're um, free to speak anonymously. <coughs> um, but these cases, um, seeking to unmask the identities of these anonymous online posters um, have brought about um, an interesting dynamic. The courts have very consistently, in these cases, applied the anonymous speech doctrine, the accompanying strict scrutiny standard, and the third party standing that I've proposed for a replacement of the reporter's privilege context. On the standing front, uh, the courts have said there are, in fact, two potential avenues for asserting the constitutional right. The anonymous speaker can assert her own right, but the communicative entities that possess the information about the identities of these initial speakers, that's like the ISP, the website host, but the online newspaper itself as well, they may do so by third party standing. And the courts are emphasizing the obstacles presented for the actual holders of the right, the relationship between the parties that gives uh, the courts confidence um, that um, these other entities will zealously argue and frame the issues for the court. Now, I think it's worth emphasizing that the closeness of the relationship between the newspaper and this after-the-fact online commenter, um, which has been found to suffice for third-party standing purposes, that's not nearly as close a relationship as the relationship that the reporter has with an actual source in the course of news gathering. The poster isn't you know, collaboratively providing information to the news gatherer's effort. They're instead speaking independently after the news gathering's all done, um, with information that neither the reporter nor the news gatherer has deemed um, newsworthy or vetted in any way, um, and often speaking in a way that, according to um, a large amount of recent communication scholarship that I've been reading, uh, the reporter and the newspaper find deeply troubling. They are not at all fans, uh, it turns out, of these folks who um, pipe up after the fact. So surely, um, the reporter source relationship, which is this true relationship that authentically combines First Amendment interests in this symbiotic way designed to contribute uh, to the larger social good, uh, surely that relationship also should suffice. Now on the substantive doctrine, 
This little line of cases, I think, is likewise illustrative. Um, and most importantly, I think it helps to show how these line uh, drawing exercises can take place. It helps to alleviate concerns that an application of the anonymous speech doctrine would lead to the overprotection of anonymity interests and the undervaluation of important competing concerns. Um, the courts in these cases are um, emphasizing the free speech rights. They're citing the substantial body of anonymous speech jurisprudence and referencing it's important to both um, the public information First Amendment values and the individual liberty First Amendment values. And they're correctly recognizing that even when a subpoena is issued against a communicative entity that possesses the identity but was given it on the understanding that they would keep it confidential, a protectable anonymous speech right remains at stake. And we see these courts taking care to prioritize these speech rights, but we also see them remaining quite cognizant of the competing need for the identity to be revealed in certain contexts. And they're doing this in a way that I think better achieves the delicate balance that was attempted by that qualified privilege um, crafted in the Brandsburg dissent and subsequently adopted in most circuits. Most notably, after indicating that the strict scrutiny test for impositions on anonymous speech requires usually the least restrictive means of meeting a compelling governmental interest, these courts have sometimes found that kind of interest to exist. Uh, when, for example, the anonymous speaker is legitimately a defendant in a civil suit for defamation or another cause of action. So say, um, because he libeled another individual in that anonymous post or when the anonymous speaker is an indispensable witness in a suit um, for which he is not a party, say because he wrote um, in an anonymous post after a story on a local murder, you know, I saw the perp uh, putting a shovel in a body-shaped bag uh, into his trunk on the night that the victim is killed. We would like to know who this person is, right? We would like to get um, this kind of information for the investigation. The least restrictive means aspect of the test means we don't just take the litigant's word for it, that the name is needed. We don't just hand over, um, unmask the anonymous speaker um, on the assertion that one of these two things is the case. Instead, the courts are engaging in a really careful assessment of, for example, the viability of that defamation suit, requiring in some instances that enough evidence be adduced uh, to survive a motion for summary judgment. Or when the anonymous speaker um, is sought as a witness, we ensure that this tailoring occurs by insisting on a showing that the subpoena was issued in good faith, that the information sought relates to a core claim or defense, that it's directly and materially relevant, that it's unavailable from any other source. Now what results from this application of the source-focused anonymous speech doctrine ends up being kind of a close cousin to the qualified privilege test set forth in the Brandsburg dissent, right? It's requiring at its core that the name be revealed as a last rather than a first resort. But it's much more carefully rooted in our longstanding First Amendment framework and much better able to recognize the full range of values um, that are at stake in a request to unmask a speaker. Thus, although the balance between um, protecting confidential sources on the one hand and recognizing these really important countervailing interests that often motivate subpoenas in civil suits and criminal prosecutions on the other hand, this balance is a really delicate one. I do think that we can have some confidence though that our already established deep-seated anonymous speech doctrine could do the trick. Given the very real interests that are at stake in this context, for the anonymous sources themselves, for the reporters that work with them, and for the public that consumes the news that they produce in this changing news environment, I think the added clarity that would come from this kind of change in focus would probably be a positive doctrinal shift. Thanks very much for your time. I uh, welcome your questions and your feedback. Yeah. This is, this is really curious about the cost of anonymous speech, and I'd like to hear you say more about it. Uh, the Supreme Court cases you quote have in mind the minority standing up to the tyranny of the majority. Right. Uh, I don't think they had in mind Scooter Libby. Uh, I'm not sure they had in mind John Marshall writing anonymously to defend his own opinions. That's right. right. Uh, uh, 
if you if you think there are real costs to anonymous speech, um, how uh, do you just reject your approach? Do you reject strict scrutiny? Or to put it differently, why is this not a defense of Justice Thomas's unique position on the present court right. that people should not only be able to spend unlimited amounts in campaigns because money is speech, but they should be able to do so anonymously? Right. Uh, Justice Scalia talks about the importance of courage and actually being able to, to own your views. To right. own your views. Right. Right. Uh, right. So, um, so two pieces to that. I think one piece um, is that the court has, and um, the paper that I'm writing um, sort of tackles um, the, ex the exceptional context of campaign finance speech. Um, a context with which the three people in the room who um, were in the building in um, uh, October term 2003 have more intimate um, affiliation than we um, ever wished to have. Um, and, that, and that context is a really interesting one. And the court has called it unique. It has repeatedly called it unique and has shaved it off in a way that, um, that sort of makes it only tangentially related to the core anonymous speech doctrine that we apply in all other contexts. When there are dollars um, associated and the right to vote is on the other end of it, right? Uh, the court has decided that the dynamic comes out differently, that one's right to make um, anonymous campaign donations is a smaller, more constrained right than one's right to speak anonymously more generally. Now, we might take some of the um, components of uh, some of the sort of best arguments about why that shaving down had to happen in order to balance other core constitutional rights uh, to heart more thoroughly and adopt a wider I guess a narrower uh, view of anonymous speech more generally. And there have been some scholars who have suggested as much, right, who have argued um, that anonymous speech isn't, uh, uh, doesn't make a major contribution to our democracy. Instead, it hinders it. It's dangerous because it allows people to um, say things um, for which they don't have to have accountability. And it allows people to be hurtful in ways um, that can, can't go appropriately checked in the marketplace of ideas, um, and that we ought to rethink sort of the core structure. The court hasn't adopted it, except in that narrow context of campaign-related speech, it hasn't adopted it. If it did adopt it, you're right that it, um, it, it takes the legs out from under both the entire anonymous speech doctrine and this proposal, right? This proposal presupposes that the court will continue to think of anonymous speech as valuable in the way that it did. Um, but I also think the reporter's privilege context is a really interesting um, context for playing out um, that sense that we have that there are competing values, right? These, this set of cases um, involving the anonymous online posters has been a really good, I think, illustration of how um, we don't just sort of blindly say, even though it's a, it's a core value, one has a, we think of it as worth protecting the right to speak anonymously. It doesn't mean it's never gonna be trumped. Um, and if you choose to use that right, um, in ways that violate the law, right? You choose to use that right as a tool for defaming or as a tool for um, <clears throat> violating other communicative rights. Um, then the court um, works that into the balancing. But the starting proposition, you're right, is that anonymous speech on the whole is worth the risks. And a lot of those cases, those early anonymous speech cases, tackle that question head on. And the court says, yes, of course we can see that people might sometimes use anonymous speech for nefarious purposes, that they might use it um, to try to engage in trickery um, or to cause harm. Um, or to be um, uh, difficult um, in a wide variety of ways. But we've, we've decided in our democracy that that trade-off is worth the balance. It might not be, um, but it's the starting proposition that we have at the moment. Yeah? Uh, so in a situation where in our democracy, we've decided that it isn't worth the balance. Uh -huh. um, so with uh, Jeff Sterling and James Risen, where there is, you know, it's a criminal violation to <coughs> disclose uh, confidential information. Right. Um, is, doesn't it? I guess having the privileged holder being the same person who is violating the law kind of bring to attention, I guess, the, uh, the need to put a value on, like, or to, to decide whether the speech is inherently value, valuable or not. Um, and would perhaps making the, the relationship between the source uh, and the, uh, the newsman um, <laughs> perhaps avoid uh, that issue by making it the, the communications between them um, rather than having 
Yeah, I think that that is um, the most interesting layer of complexity that's involved here, right? We have a bunch of cases that are happening right now that involve assertions at the ground level that the speech itself is illegal, right? Um, and, that, and basically that's what's happening in the defamation context that I was just describing. Uh, you do have a right to speak anonymously, but you don't have a right to use your speech to defame someone. And therefore you also don't have a right to anonymously use your speech to defame someone. Presumably, um, if we believe that you don't have a right um, to speak in some other way, let's say to reveal a national security secret, for example. Um, if you don't have a right to speak in that way, then you also don't have a right um, to speak anonymously in that way. Um, and the coupling of the anonymous speech right with the news gathering right in this way um, undercuts the ability for some of those leaks to occur. Um, Two responses to that. Uh, one is that if we, ha I, th I think that the core um, debate over how much we want um, to allow people to leak information and how much we don't want them to, right? How harmful or beneficial we think leaks might be in any individual context, better occurs at a foundational level when we're thinking about the actual right to say that or not say that than it does three times removed at a question of whether we have a news gathering right or don't have a news gathering right. Um, the newsmen who hear me um, present this idea hate this, right? Um, they would prefer to hang on to, uh, both because everybody always would prefer to have their own right rather than um, be once removed from the right at stake. That's just a natural tendency for us to prefer a right that is stage one rather than a right that is stage two, but also because I think there are legitimate concerns that the court will never fully recognize any value in leaking information. Um, and I think that that's an ongoing debate that's worth having. I actually think that there probably is some value to leaked information even after it's been deemed classified by the government, right? And we might want to think really carefully about how that tension should be resolved. But in my mind, it is a more solid debate to have at stage one. Um, we should tweak those stage one rights at stage one and then adopt them into this context uh, rather than having there be an odd dichotomy in which you are technically a law violator, um, but at the news gathering stage, we nevertheless see some value um, in it happening. I think consistently, um, as a constitutional norm, it makes more sense to handle it one, two, rather than one, two. <laughs> yeah, here and then here. Yeah, thanks. Why do people who are, uh, why do the reporters, as you were saying, hate it so much. Just why are these two mutually exclusive? Why can't they both invoke the rights as you describe them? Right. I, I think it is not necessarily the case that they would have to be mutually exclusive, right? It certainly could be the case that the First Amendment stands for multiple propositions, um, that it stands for the proposition that um, an individual speaker has a right to speak and to do so anonymously if she chooses, and that there is First Amendment value in news gathering, and therefore the Brandsburg um, dissenting qualified privilege is constitutionally mandated and not to be upheld, and both rights could be asserted. Um, I think as a practical matter, the courts are likely to choose one avenue over the other, right? They're <clears throat> likely to, um, and uh, as a practical matter, there's usually only one entity that's asserting the right. Um, the entity, the, the rubber hits the road in these cases when the subpoena gets issued, right? You receive the subpoena, and, and um, while we're speaking of it as subpoenas that are being issued to, to reporters, it's a larger scope of cases now, right? Now it's subpoenas being issued to Twitter or subpoenas being issued um, to people involving um, other social media activity in the Occupy Wall Street um, cases, or um, there's a, a wide array of circumstances in which somebody wishes not to reveal the name um, of a communicative entity, uh, and the holder of that identity is subpoenaed. Um, I suppose it's possible that the two could map onto one another, that they would exist in tandem. And it seems to me, it was actually flabbergasting to me when I did the sort of large-scale historical inquiry. I fully expected, actually, to get back to all of the briefing in Brandsburg versus Hayes, which was a consolidated case. There were three separate cases from different circuits that came to the court all at one time, really pressing this question of, can reporters refuse to respond to subpoenas when there's a confidential source on the other hand? And I was so sure uh, that there were, was going to be sort of tier two argument, right? Roman one was going to be in the brief. Uh, we have a reporter's privilege, and you should recognize it. And Roman two would be something about the anonymous speech rights of the speaker. And it just 
wasn't there, um, except for some passing references in some amici um, submissions. It just wasn't the line of thinking. And I think, um, I think that that was um, sort of a weird blip, that we constitutionally do have this set of rights, and that at a minimum, the court needs to acknowledge that they're all bound up in what's happening here. Yeah, did you have a... <laughs> yeah, thanks. I don't actually know what kind of time I'm supposed to be keeping, so somebody will pull out a hook if there's... Have until 1.15. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> to begin with, everything you say makes perfectly good sense. It's coherent and interesting, and I certainly think it's better than a report. But I want to ask you, if you will, indulge me in just a small game. Imagine presenting this in a forum in which Justice Black were present. Mm -hmm. And respond, if you will, to what you imagine Justice Black would say <laughs> um, to the proposal. Because I think he wouldn't like it very much more than he would like the reporter's privilege. Uh, no, I think that's probably right. Hmm? Yeah, and I think that that, that would be true um, not that would be true globally, right? And many of the critiques that one ha might have about a system of reporter's privilege <clears throat> are the same kinds of critiques that one might have about shifting it to an anonymous source focus. Because uh, while I'm making sort of a micro critique, this Brandsburg approach is um, runs into these bumps because we have difficulty defining who's a reporter. We have difficulty sort of actually figuring out as a logistical matter how much the flow will be impeded. Um, there are also sort of macro critiques that get made in this area, which is that, um, I mean, in the words of Wigmore, right, uh, the law of evidence is really clear. Um, the subpoena statutes have been on the books for a very long time, and the truth is, the courts are entitled to, in the language of um, Wigmore, every man's evidence, right? So you're um, a reporter, and you think that you have a really good reason for not revealing this information, but so do lots of other people who are subpoenaed for information, prefer not to, all things considered, I prefer not to tell you as to tell you, um, we don't bend to those kinds of concerns. And we might think um, that the whole scheme is not worth maintaining, that we ought to just have a system whereby um, you can make whatever kinds of promises you're willing to make, uh, but, the, but you can't rely on the courts after the fact to um, protect you in making them. Um, and I suppose that that's a sort of large-scale critique of the position. I, I think, and I, I may well, I can confess that I am colored by my um, journalist past. I actually was the recipient of a subpoena um, when I was a 23-year-old um, reporter. I was received a subpoena um, in a murder case. And um, I remember calling my mother and saying, um, I just got something, um, and I couldn't, you guys, I couldn't pronounce it. I got a subbiona, I, I didn't, I don't know what I got, but it looks scary, right? Uh, something has happened to me that is alarming to me, and maybe I don't want to be in the information gathering business anymore. Um, I'm of the, I, I do buy in, I do drink the Kool-Aid to the extent that I believe that there are circumstances in which um, societal values are enhanced uh, by the ability of people engaging in investigative reporting to talk to people off the record, right? Whistleblowers, um, people who have inside information into government or into the malfeasance or bad, bad actions of um, various companies, um, that there are reasons why you wouldn't want to speak up and attach your name to it, but that the information that you have would in fact um, advance societal dialogue in important ways. Um, I think that the tensions are... Um, deeper and stronger than a lot of people in the media law realm are willing to recognize, that the countervailing values are equally strong in some circumstances. Um, but I think that we need a framework for thinking about constitutionally what rights are actually at stake. And it's alarming to me that it, we would have dialogues about this. Entire conferences, right? I've been to many, many First Amendment and media law conferences in which um, we never um, we never mention the source. And I think that that's um, that's a lapse that we ought to correct. Yeah. So I've been trying to understand what the source's interest is here. And so this goes back to your earlier point that one of the advantages of your approach is that it lets us <coughs> take, take 
view of the full interest at stake. And so it's not just about the public value, it's also about this individual right. And maybe this is because I don't know anything about the First Amendment, but I don't, it's hard for me to understand what the individual interest is or why we would pay attention to it or how it could make a difference to the cases. And so in response to David's question just now, you talked about the public value of anonymous mm -hmm. speech. Um, and in response to earlier questions, you talked about speech that <coughs> we're pretty much going to make you disclose your, your identity anyway because your speech is defamatory or you're violating a right. law against leaking. And so I'm having a hard time imagining the middle set of cases where your speech isn't publicly valuable. We couldn't defend it on those grounds. Right. But it's also not illegal. And so we're not going to sort of balance that away. Right. And so the individual interest is actually doing some work. Right. So I'm not sure that they're, they are separate spheres. Right. I, I'm not sure that it's, ever, that it's necessarily the case that um, the speech that would serve the individual liberty values um, is necessarily um, sort of, if we're drawing concentric circles, um, another, con another circle altogether, an, a non-overlapping circle or even a non-totally overlapping circle from the public information values. But even if I have an individual liberty value that is likewise some other kind of value, if it's my individual liberty value, um, then what we're looking at is, firstly, an assertion of the right, which I think we can't, uh, part, of, part of this piece was um, informed by this um, piece that I did a couple of years ago about democracy and the death of newspapers. And I started to get um, super alarmed, basically, at um, looking through uh, my First Amendment casebook and realizing what a huge percentage of the cases that bring about major First Amendment uh, movement in our country were litigated by um, sort of large-scale corporate media entities. And the holdings in those cases weren't, for example, Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, right? The holding isn't newspapers have a right to access a criminal trial. The holding is we, uh, the people, individually have a right to access a criminal trial, but the dollars to litigate that case came from Richmond newspapers, right? And, and the um, amici who were willing to sort of um, chime in and get it done. <clears throat> and I don't think that happens anymore. I think it's happening less and less frequently, and there are fewer and fewer entities that are willing to sort of um, own the First Amendment litigation platform and move forward in those ways. And if for no other reason, I think um, the absence of an entity that might go to bat, the statistics are actually pretty alarming in terms of reporters' privilege cases. Um, uh, basically in surveys conducted by um, social scientists in the journalism area, uh, the, it's demonstrated pretty clearly that they're just defending these less often, just giving up the names, right? Um, just, uh, uh, we used to do so sort of on matter of principle and because it helped our bottom line to be thought of as people who kept promises, but we can't do it anymore because our choices are to litigate that or to fire half the newsroom, right? And we can't um, move forward in that way. And it would seem to me that if it is the case that the um, underlying speaker has a set of rights, um, they ought not rise and fall on whether somebody else is willing um, to think about them. And I, I do think um, this, it resonates with me as true that individual liberty First Amendment values play a different kind of role in the speaker's life than the public, maybe the person who's offering up this information does care. I do think I'm making a contribution. I do think this is gonna be important. I do think you all should hear about this and should talk about this. Democracy will be enhanced by me saying it. But there are also are lots of instances in which people want to speak anonymously for reasons that fall into that sort of autonomy, self-interest. I would like to say this, and I would like people to, to take it on its merits. I don't want them to judge it based on loving me or hating me. I want them to put it, I want to put it out there um, and have it um, rise and fall on its own virtues. Um, and that strikes me um, as an important value, whether or not um, we as a society ultimately grab that and decide that it's great, and certainly whether or not big media company X decides that it's a value worth enforcing, I think the person ought to have the right um, to enforce it. But yes, I agree that the circles may heavily overlap. Other questions? Comments? Yeah, thanks. So, so I really like this project, and I, I just have a question about um, how to characterize it. So, so one way of characterizing this would be to say 
you know, we've all agreed on some set of values and it's just the framework that we currently have in place doesn't get us there very well, right? So you, you're giving us a more effective way to getting to where we've all agreed we should really be going. Um, but the second characterization would be to say, it's not really that, it's really something a little bit different, which is to say, your framework takes us to a place that you just think is more normatively desirable, right? Mm -hmm. That you actually think that there are certain things that we should be appreciating that we're not, there are certain values that we should be getting towards that um, you know, we haven't gotten there yet. And I'm, so right. I'm still not sure qu quite how much of it is column A and how much of it is column B. Yes, I think it is some blending of column A and column B, but it's maybe more heavily A in the sense that um, I have not advocated anything in my current piece as it now stands in the way of an expansion of an anonymous speech right. Right? Every, the, you know, part 2B of the paper is just let me lay out there for you doctrinally what the Supreme Court has already stated in unequivocal terms about what rights an individual speaker has to speak anonymously. And the project is mostly designed, at least at stage one, I mean, I agree that stage, right, this is sort of a companion um, question to the one that was asked earlier. Plainly, stages three and four are going to require us to ask what we want, the sh right, the, the greater we start recognizing um, instances in which we can invoke this anonymous speech right, the rubber will hit the road and we'll have to actually talk about the, the contours of that right and where its boundaries exist in ways that maybe we haven't before because it has only come up in the individual door-to-door -door leafleting context. But um, as a starting proposition, I'm really just trying to um, sort of make the synapses connect between these two bodies that seem to me deeply related. I mean, it just seems inconceivable to me that we couldn't refer to a confidential source. I think confidential source is, this, is just a word that we right now use for anonymous speaker. And for us not to at least acknowledge that there are these two bodies of law that have been kind of engaging in parallel play <laughs> for such a long time, to see how they map onto each other, I think is an important starting proposition. That's a good question, though. Yeah. I would just say that I think it's just as much column B as column A. <laughs> because when you see two two areas of doctrine that are going along parallel tracks, right, there's something external to the doctrine that's moving you to think that you ought to be connected. I guess that's right. And I would say that it's always that way. <laughs> right? It's always that way. It, it, yes, there's it, always some normative um, motivation for me to say, look over here, there are two, there are two and we should think of them as one. Um, but if the question is, do I think that the anonymous speech doctrine should do something more than it does right now in terms of um, its recognition from the court, the answer is no. I may actually think that it needs to do something less, right, in terms of thinking about um, the earlier question. But um, I think we ought to think of that doctrine as applicable in this context in a way that the courts haven't, in part, I really think, because of just the historical norms of the time that brought about the doctrinal development. Can I just bother you one more time about campaign finance. Yeah, yes. <laughs> no. It's one thing to reject Citizens United. It's one thing to reject the idea that money is speech. But if you really take it seriously, I don't see why the exact same values that you're associating with, una with anonymity in other contexts aren't implicated here. There are reasons why donors to super PACs don't want people to know who they are. Mm -hmm. They think the effectiveness of their spending and their speech will be undermined if people know. Yeah. It's just a small number of right-wing billionaires, right? Or you are religiously opposed to homosexuality, and you want to contribute to campaigns to defeat yeah. Prop 8. That's right. right? Uh, uh, Better that you not or, know or, who or, I or, am. Or actually, That's or, right. Or to defeat or to advocate on behalf of, and you're very concerned that you're going to be on the receiving end of a whole lot of harassment and maybe even violence if people know. I mean, it's the, it's the exact same values. So I don't think you could just say, well, the Supreme Court said it's different. That's right. How is it different if you believe that money is speech in these ways? Right. So um, I'm not positive that I believe that money is speech as a starting proposition, right? So that might, um, if, if we're asking the Ronell Anderson Jones version of this, um, my tackling of that starts at a different level, right? It starts at a different level in terms of the First Amendment implications at all. But I, um, and I also, but I also think that part of what's happening here, the way that the Supreme Court has gotten itself there in making these just um, different categories of speech, is uh, the court has started with a proposition 
Um, anonymous speech is super valuable. It is um, a core, top, um, uh, important, high order constitutional right. And it seems to us that that right isn't trumped very often, notwithstanding the very large risks that attend it. And so in all of these other cases involving the anonymous leafleting and involving door-to-door -door advocacy and involving people who want to um, share their ideas in a general way but not in a campaign finance way, um, the court has said huge risks. We get that there are times when people will say things that are um, distressing but we're not going to, but the, this top value still trumps. And for whatever reason, and I think it's a debatable reason, the court has said that the rights that are at stake in the campaign finance context, which is the legitimacy of our elections, the... Um, that's what's at stake in Citizens yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 the, um, yeah. <laughs> so, I, but I, I think... I don't, I don't think that those, that value equation is necessarily right. And I think that it is, there are, there are many people, I think, very thoughtfully arguing that um, Larissa Litsky at, um, at the University of Florida um, produced this really interesting piece where she essentially said, um, hey, Supreme Court and your entire body of literature um, uh, related to campaign finance, what about the anonymous leafleting cases, right? How can you consistently say, um, in, and in some of these anonymous leafleting cases, a lot of the arguments that were made were, the reason that we need you to have a badge on you when you go door to door advocating for a particular proposition is that it's only fair in a democracy that you own your idea, right? That you, and the court rejected it. The court said, uh, no, uh, that, would, um, that would enhance the debate. There might be some concerns about fraud. There might be some concerns about misleading people. But we reject that because the First Amendment anonymous speech value is so core. It's so trumping. Um, in the campaign finance context, there is something about uh, the electoral process that has led the court to believe otherwise. It may well be um, a gross inconsistency um, but if it's a gross inconsistency, probably the right way to make it consistent um, is a way that I'm not totally happy to go. <laughs> well, I want to uh, thank you very much for a rich and illuminating discussion, and thank you all as well for joining us today. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.